you could just speak a little bit so I can hear and make sure. Hi, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> What got you excited about JFK? What made you choose him? Well, I want to do you know, the plaza as a whole and how the plaza uh, changed, you know, so how it had one meaning for Dallas and then suddenly it had a different meaning for the world. Yeah. So I'm trying to do the whole story. That's what I what found particularly interesting about it, how places mean things to people, but they you know, change over time. Uh, can you start off by telling me your name? Tina. You and what you do? Tina Howard. Um, I live here in Dallas, and I'm a vendor slash work with the researcher authors whenever I get the chance. Yeah, you can just talk to me. Just okay. Keep going the camera, we'll right, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been working on here? Eleven years. This is my eleventh year. Um, and, uh, were you born here? Mm -mm. No, I'm a Yankee from Detroit. Um, came to Texas, left twice, and came back. Got interested in JFK, and here I am still. I'll probably be here when I'm 80. The only girl out of 14 men. Really? You're in the same paper? In vendor. Well, no, I carry um, the research paper because we're ongoing studying. She's got um, a new magazine coming out in three weeks. This one kind of touches on the assassins and the conspirators, but she's taking it a step farther. So who is it that you? Diane Allen. And uh, this will be her sixth magazine that's come out. Um, do you uh, have any political affiliation yourself, political person? No, I mean, I have my opinions of what goes on with the government. I have my opinions of what went on back at that time, you know. Um, in as much as do I think a conspiracy is, is possible, yeah. I really do. Particular conspiracy that makes sense to you. I mean, a particular um, particular people involved that makes more sense to you. Yeah. Well, I I happen to be acquainted with a gentleman named Billy Saul Estes, and in the '60s he was highly involved um, in a, a scam back at that time that involved Texas industry. It was um, cow manure fertilizer, and uh, he lived right across the street from J. Edgar Hoover who in as much this was the involvement around in Lyndon Baines Johnson back at that time, you know, and um, he got a little close to Johnson and that's where the involvement and my involvement even deeper has come into this because he's now 78 years old. He spent 11 years in prison because he wouldn't give up the names of the assassins that he knew. He was what they call, um, they call him Billy Saul, Texas, King of the West. And uh, he was a multi-billionaire He's asked the government repeatedly to give him immunity, and because the government doesn't want to know what went on, they don't want to grant immunity. So now he's dying, and he's going to tell it all. Um, they won't even allow his book over here. The book is in France. It's been in France for four years now, and each time he tries to have it printed in the United States, boom, something happens. Um, <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, just for a moment, can I ask about uh, Dewey Plaza? Do you know anything about the Judy Dealey? Yeah, we, um, in fact, yesterday we um, got to meet a fifth descendant of Dealey Plaza. He runs a limousine service down here. And he was telling us about the little courthouse that it used to sit right in the middle of the plaza in the 1800s. And, um, History-wise, Richard Dealey was just a very important person to the city of Dallas, you know. And um, then, of course, you had your assassination, which was a major thing in the 60s. Right. Um, have you uh, been over to the Kennedy Memorial? Mm. Over there? Mm. What do you think of that? It's called a CENTAPH, C-E-N-T-A-P-H. That means Open Air Memorial. Um, I would think a whole lot more of it if it was down here. Why is that? Because I feel that um, in my 11 years down here, I have talked to someone from every country in the world, every city in the United States, and the biggest ooh and ah, or the biggest I don't understand, 
is why is the memorial hidden a block away behind a humongous, what we call a castle? You know, um, we have went to numerous um, public hearing meetings. We have given petitions to even get an eternal flame on it. And it's just like they ignore us and hope that we'll go away. We are now petitioning for Elm Street to be renamed JFK Boulevard. And we got slapped down on that last month. Why'd you want to do that? Because I believe that since it happened in Dealey Plaza, and I'm a 60s kid, and that was my president, you know, I just believe if we can name streets after Bush, Caesar, Malcolm X, why can't we have a street after John Fitzgerald Kennedy? You know, I'm, I know there was a lot of people that didn't like him and his beliefs, but there were a lot of us. Same as I would want a street named Martin Luther King. I believe the in indention on the world that was made by him, well, here it is, 40 years later, and I've spent 11 of them down here talking to, like I said, everybody from all over the world. In fact, yesterday I talked to people from the Netherlands. Now, that was the first, and uh, they said people stood in the streets and cried, you know, on that day. I've had Cubans, I've had Germans. It's, it's amazing that every single person knows what they were doing in 1963. Jamie, let me add one more thing. I commend today's parent because they're bringing their kids down here. They let us talk to them and they're letting the kids today weigh what they feel. Conspiracy, assassination, conspiracy, assassination. And I think that that is so commendable, unlike what we were told. We were told to believe it or else. And today's parent is so open and it wouldn't have happened today's youth. Your generation, the next generation, it won't happen to. I love it. I love it because I know Ron Rice personally. You know, he's he's the longest person that's been out here on the streets. I'm probably the second longest. And if you go in there and you listen to him, he is so articulate on the assassination. And I believe that upstairs here, this is a fine museum. I've been through it many, many times, but I even feel if they would allow the entire Zaputo film to be shown, it'd give the tourist a more accurate way to go out on the street and determine exactly what happened. Once you go to the Conspiracy Museum and you are allowed to see the entire Zaputo film and the way the president's head goes back and to the left, you really realize the shot didn't come from that window. Oh, it was pretty neat. They had everything closed off. All the streets were closed off. He didn't pop in for a day or two, for three hours a day. It was just, he, he's a remarkable man. I was real lucky to get to meet a lot of these people because of knowing two of the witnesses, um, Beverly Oliver and Jean Hill. That's your red raincoat lady and your babushka lady back in the 60s. So, and then I always go to the uh, convention. So I got to be a little bit more involved in, in when Oliver Stone was here, besides the fact I was working for Robert Groden back at that time, who wrote the book, A Killing of a President. So it was just, it was unique. I think it was accurate. I wish they would do a sequel or a second part, but I don't ever foresee that happening because of all the controversy. To tell what story, if you want? Well, to go on to tell the facts that have come out today about him opening up the files here a couple months ago, releasing 16,000 pages of doctored garbage. It's the best way to, I'm pretty blunt. It was doctored garbage and seal them back up and give you another 29 years to doctor the other 133 million pages. You know, if you don't think it can't be doctored in 29 years, it sure can. You know, it's the same as the autopsy report. Why was it ordered on Oswald? Why was it ordered to be burned the next morning? This stupidity. But Oliver Stone was fantastic. He's a very gracious man. Kevin Cosner, all the people that were in the movie. Mr. Groden starred in five parts in the movie.
and uh, so we got to get a little close. And then when they return back, they always come. In fact, Kevin Cosner always goes in the museum and gets Diane Allen and myself the little gold, gold Kennedy coin and always gives them to us. So he's a pretty nice guy. Um, was it at all weird watching the film? It was very weird in the evenings after the film and shut down and when they do the shooting and, and whatever. It almost, it, once you've watched the Zapooter film, uh, with audio effects, the bullets, you know, interjected in there at about the time they were shot. It's very spooky. It's very spooky in Dealey Plaza after you've been on here 12 to 15 hours. And we sat up on the pergola some nights and we look up and we think Jack Ruby, you know, he was in the jail right back here. We think he's looking out at us when the sirens go through. But yeah, it was very eerie much more than the BBC last week, it, because it was accurate. It, it was pretty much in tune with what we've discovered happened that day. So tell me about the BBC. <laughs> the, my worst complaint is they had Jean Hill, the red raincoat lady, on the grassy knoll. And she wasn't on the grassy knoll. She was across the street with Beverly Oliver, Mary Mormon, Bill Newman. They were all across the street when the shots were fired. They ran toward the knoll. They weren't on this side. And we kept telling them, you know, if you're going to shoot this, shoot it with accuracy. You know, and, and after you've been down here so long, we try not to tell anybody anything that we can't prove in black and white. And after you research before you write it, you know, which even in the magazine I gave you, there is a very questionable page and and while I'm talking to you I'll tell you to research a gentleman named Billy Lovelady because the picture you're gonna see in there of Oswald in the doorway at the time of the assassination is it Oswald or is it Billy Lovelady he was a look-alike in the 60s that they tried to pass off I'm not sure who was in the doorway we've we've zoomed it up so big that but um the BBC just, but they said that they were going to interject it with other films. So, but what they did, they, they didn't have a car in front of the president's car. They had one motorcycle, and at the very end, they put one Secret Service guy on the car. That was it. So they just didn't have people in the right places. I really don't. I mean, I, I pretty much very much enjoyed the film. I mean, everything's got a Hollywood tinge to it, but um, being the people he worked with, Gene Hill, again, the Red Raincoat Lady, these were all people that were here that day. And Robert Groden is a foremost author and historian on, on the Kennedy subject. So I believe that he came to the people that really were involved in Dealey Plaza and, and that were here that day and, and at that time there were there were many more alive there's only two people left alive today and that's um, Beverly Oliver and um, Ed Hoffman the deaf mute that's your only two living witnesses that were confirmed witnesses November 23rd 1963 confirmed witnesses confirmed you had 351 confirmed witnesses that went on on the FBI affidavits that were talked to. 200 of those met mysterious deaths. What about the rest of them? I can't tell you about the rest. I can just account for um, mailboxes blowing up, brake failure, Lee Bowers in the tower. His brakes failed, driving a brand new car. He hit an embankment at 65 miles an hour. We can just confirm the aura of the, the, the mysteriousness of 200, of the 150. Now, who knows who didn't come forward, you know? I'm very sure there's ones that didn't come forward. But there's a small list in the magazine I gave you of actual witnesses and where they were with 100% accuracy. So when did you, uh, did you 
did you just start doing this as a job, or did you get interested in it? And then I started doing it as a job, and then got to meet the authors and attend some conventions and really get into the research part of it. I mean, I I can remember nine years ago of driving around, around and around and around to research the bridge of the, tr uh, the freeway that Ed Hoffman was standing on. And he stated by interpreter, which he's told over 40 years, well, actually not over 40, because he had to go to Switzerland. He was being threatened. But we sat out here and we researched. So once I got into the research, I'm enthralled. And I go out and spend weekends where we're just looking in books, just getting on the computer. What, uh, what conference do you go to? Um, well, we call them the Kennedy Trekkers. But every year um, in October, right before the um, date of the assassination, conventions start coming in. And a uh, year before last, I got to meet Judge Joe Brown. I don't know if you've ever seen him on TV. But he's on one of those judge TV shows. But to listen to him over here at the Hotel Lawrence talk about Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy, I was video cam camming it, and I couldn't run the, com the video camera. I was just amazed by his facts and the things that came out of his mouth about both assassinations. So I try to attend at least a convention each year. There's usually about anywhere from four to eleven, just depending on, on how many people decide to meet in Dallas that year. They're big conventions, it's all researchers. What are the groups? We just, they, we just, we call them Kennedy Trekkers is what we call them. But they're just people that are into Martin Luther King, um, any assassination that, that basically was ever held that had any political involvement is who these people are. Well, that's just, that's just our name for it, I'm the vendor's name. or the, Well, I, if you, I'm a Trekkie, too, because I go to them. And I don't go to their, their suave dinners and stuff afterwards. I go just for the knowledge of what you gain. Um, last year, I helped promote a couple of books is why I went. You know, again, because I work with the authors. You get invited to them. Not every vendor gets to go to them. You know, there's, um, well, there's actually only two of us out there. We have some problem children out there. Problem children. Problem children. Yeah, the, the problem in the plaza is um, lying to the tourists to sell a paper. I have a severe problem with that. If you, I, I'm going to talk to you for 30 minutes if you're questioning me whether I sell you a paper or not. I allow you to pick my brain, everything I know. So I have problems with problem children that don't handle the tourism in Dealey Plaza right, professionally. What kind of lies do you <laughs> Oh, I think my two favorites are Oswald was shot right across the street in the underground passageway when it was eight blocks down on uh, Elm and Irving. And then we got a little guy on Saturday and Sunday, he's too cute. He's about, oh, if he's 30, that's pushing it. But he was in the cell next to Jack Ruby, which anybody that knows anything about the assassination knows that Jack Ruby was actually chained to the wall, and the entire floor was vacated. You know, they had a big assassin in there. So that's my two favorites, you know. But do you hear him tell, oh, they tell all kinds of things, you know. They tell you the theater is right down the street. No, that's where Jack Ruby's nightclub was. It's the Majestic Theater today. The theater's actually about four miles across town where they found Oswald. But I'm a stickler for facts, too. You know, if, if we, we learn a lot from the tourists, Jamie, a whole lot from the tourists. And then if somebody says something to me, I'm going to go home and look it up, research it, find out. So I'm just a stickler on the facts, you know. Somebody uh, mentioned to me the name of one of those groups, the Lancer group. JFK dot Lancer. Oh well, I'm sorry. www.jfklancer.com, jfkmurder.com, jfkinfoassassination.com are your three websites. Lancer brings up a really nice website. 
That was Kennedy's code name. Code name when he was in the service was Lancer. Whatever war he was. I'm not familiar with any any group named Lancer. There might be, but I'm not familiar with one. Um, I would imagine that you have a bunch of Kennedy people that there probably is a group named Lancer. I'm just not aware of one. Uh, well, I heard a story. We were here last year on the anniversary. Mm -hmm. and Every year. I heard that there were. Oh, you're talking about the Lancer group. Yeah. Yeah, and they didn't allow them to speak. And, and somebody had a bullhorn, somebody didn't bullhorn. Yeah. Oh, well, they had a bullhorn and they were trying to speak, and we had Beverly Oliver singing the anthem. Who was we? Who was <laughs> <laughs> We is the group I was with, the, the authors and the research people, and. Uh, um, What's it called? Oh, um, um, I can't even think of our names. Um, it's in the paper. Um, what is our production? Frontier Productions, Incorporated. And uh, they were trying to get out there on a bullhorn, but they were do weren't doing it in the right way. Because see, the First Amendment allows you to get up there and say anything. That's your right. And they had a right to their time, but just not during the anniversary, the 30 minutes. It's a very short, very cut and dry. You know, the mayor gets up, says his little spiel, which I feel is a spiel each year. You know, uh, I'm sure they try to find a descendant of Kabul. That's a pun. That's a bad joke. Because Kabul changed the parade right at the last, oh, about four days before the rock bet. But it doesn't have anything to do with his brother being fired by Kennedy either. What way was the route changed? The route was supposed to, originally supposed to go down Main Street straight down Main Street. See, Secret Service law states you must go 24.3 or over miles an hour at all given times. By going straight down Main Street, they would have maintained their speed and momentum. But by making them turn right onto Houston and left onto Elm, on Houston, we got it down to where they were going 5.6 miles an hour and they dropped to 4.3 right here when they turned left. They never regained momentum. They also changed drivers about five minutes before the parade took off that day. That original driver, by the way, committed suicide because he felt he had not done his job as the Secret Service agent to protect Kennedy. And then when it went down Main Street, where was it? He went directly to the Trade Center. But see, Main Street is the, the straight street out there, so there would have never been any turns. But why Kabul changed the parade? We well, we were told, the researchers were told he changed the parade route because he didn't want Kennedy to see all the homeless living under the bridge. But the jail's been over there forever and nobody lives under the bridge. They don't allow it. It's too close to the jail. But then we, we went back and we found out that his brother had been fired from the Secret Service by Kennedy shortly before the parade that day. Again, these are facts you'll probably have to look up and confirm that they're true. When you, uh, I know you said that after 12 hours being here, the clock got a weird feel, but just normally, I mean, the clock is still giving you a feeling. When the sirens and the fire engines go by and click on the sirens, I don't stand on the X. I mean, many tourists have asked me to. I maintain the X. I keep the X in the road. I took over from Ron Rice from the Conspiracy Museum when he left the streets. But I don't stand on the X. I feel it's sacrilegious. But yeah, there's an overall, it's more after the amount of time you spend here that you're tired at the end of the day. But overall, you just, since you're so constantly talking, you know, we, we tell our tale, our story, our, our, our beliefs 150, 200 times a day. Maybe 250, maybe three, dependent. But I've seen 75,000 people in the plaza, too. You know. When you say you maintain the X, you mean you 
I keep it down there. We're not allowed to put a permanent one down. So I put the tape that marks the X at the pre precise spot that the headshot was fired. Who, uh, who marked that uh, Ron Rice marked it with his calculations and measurements from the bridge, from uh, the knoll, and from his um, research of where the car, well, it's actually marked in two places out there. It's marked at the first shot on the curb, then it's marked by the X on the fatal headshot. And it also helps when you're talking to the tourists that you can give them an either or, Oswald conspiracy, Oswald conspiracy, because they can go up and they always, even with the railroad working on, on the knoll right now, they still put up a chain link fence to allow them that space to go behind the, the picket fence. And once you go up there and you look out at that X, you have a bit of an idea where a shot might have came from. Very spooky feeling. Yeah. I had a spooky feeling first time I came to the plaza. Um, do you think that Dewey Plaza will continue to attract people 50 years from now, 100 years from now? I think so. I think it's one of the largest tour, tourist attractions in the world. I know that maybe you're not seeing it now, but if you're in town on Saturday and Sunday, you're going to see even more. I mean, we work off of conventions and things like that, but overall in the summer, you get the gist of how large of a tourist attraction it is. And like I said, I've seen 75,000 and I've seen one. You know, it's just dependent around the anniversary not only does it get eerily spooky, but just to see older people walking down the street with a clump of flowers or to put a flag down there by where the X is is very, very spooky. And I think it will continue to attract, yeah. I think that this is history. It's a very avid part of history. Some of our largest people that come right now are the teachers. And see, for the longest time, they wouldn't allow them to talk to us. They wouldn't buy the magazines. But more and more and more, the teachers will have one of us give her, their group um, a tour, talk to the kids, allow them to get both sides. Don't get me wrong, I'm not all conspiracy. I have a no, very open mind as to what um, the government insists on happening that day. I'm just as much up on the Warren Commission as the House Select. You know, but I have my own personal beliefs too. Well, I appreciate that. Okay. Is there anything that you feel I, forgot I would just like somebody to just get some mention of Kennedy in Dealey Plaza. Put something down here that has something to do with Kennedy. Because if he lived and died here, why shouldn't we remember him by something in the plaza? Because the tourists, that is the main contention of disrespect down here, is nothing to do with Kennedy. That it's hidden behind the castle. Change the street name. Just something to do with Kennedy. Because if we explain it a hundred times a day, we explain it ten. Why there is nothing to do with Kennedy down here. Allegedly shot Kennedy allegedly shot Kennedy. That's the only mention of John F. Kennedy. Even a memorial plaque in the ground somewhere to where we don't, I mean, we told a family of about 18 last week to go behind the castle and they were upset. They wouldn't even go back there and see the memorial. That's what I'd like to see changed. Yeah, one thing, when you mentioned the election week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's always scratched. One hour after it's painted, it will be scratched. I don't do it. We don't do it. I swear to Buddha we don't do it. But somehow, by the time it's painted today, when you come back tomorrow morning, it will be scratched out. Now, whether it, the paint falls off or what, Jamie, I don't know. But it's the 11 years I've been here. You watch them paint it, you come back the next day, it's gone. <laughs> so you're not the maintainer of the election? No. <laughs> No, I don't deteriorate things. <laughs> no, I'm gonna take this off. Oh, I'm gonna take off without it, huh? Yeah. No, I'm just maintaining the X. Yeah, drop it down.